before I address uh, the subject matter, I just want to uh, point out that uh, uh, at the very beginning of my last video, I said that it was Tuesday, which is correct, Tuesday the 30th of May, and then just before I finished the video, <laughs> I said, I, I told you all to have a good weekend, <laughs> so um, don't get confused about when that was posted. And I'm actually making this in the evening on the same day, but both of these videos will go out tomorrow morning, so Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday the 30, well, not the 31st, I guess it'll be the 1st, right? Um, 1st of June. So, this is about, well, the, the title of the video is How David Bentley Hart Proved Too Much. David Bentley Hart is, um, a very profound philosopher and thinker within the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church. Um, he presents some very good logical and philosophical arguments for universalism. I actually used some of his arguments um, when I became a universalist, and I read his excellent book, uh, which I don't recall now the title of. Um, I guess it'll. I guess it's something like that. All that all shall be saved. Something like that. Um, and I'm a bit partial to him in the sense that he um, believes Father Sergei Bulgakov, who taught um, sophiology is probably the most profound um, of Orthodox contemporary theologians within the, you know, the past uh, hundred years or so. I think he's probably the most uh, profound thinker of all time. Um, but that's another subject. I, I mean, of all time within the Orthodox tradition. Anyway, so I, I find, I found Hart's, one, uh, well, there were, I, I found several arguments quite um, convincing, but there's one argument I want to focus on that he made. I want to focus on that here. And I'm going to argue that he proved too much with that argument. I agree with his argument as not only to its effectiveness, but as to its general veracity. But I want to show that the logic he employed, the style of the argument, the nature of the argument, actually uh, undercuts his orthodox commitment to the doctrine of the incarnation. So, two terms we'll be using in this video, eschatology and etiology, or etiology. Most of you are aware with what the term eschatology means, or what it <clears throat> connotes, which is, um, you know, the, the time after death. You know, uh, af the afterlife. Um, the eschaton being the, the age after, not just after we die individually, but the eon that is usher ushered in when everything on Earth, uh, Earth's, Earth's history has come to a... Uh, or at least it, the, it's in its fallen state, has reached uh, its culmination and it gets perfected in the age to come. That's eschatology. Etiology or etiology, not exactly sure how that should be pronounced. Um, 
refers to its opposite. It refers to origins. It refers to beginnings or even to a time prior, quote unquote, to the creation of the world. So very simply, Hart's argument concerning universalism goes as follows. If God were to allow even one person to endure eternal conscious punishment and to go for all eternity without redemption and without reconciliation with the Creator, what that would mean, that would reflect directly upon our etiology. It would, it would necessarily mean or imply that from eternity past, that God pre-eternally um, uh, foreordained or preordained that that person should be eternally damned. And you would be forced to worship a God like that. You would be forced to worship a sadistic more or less Calvinistic God. So, I'm going to use the same type of argument, but I'm going to start with etiology and proceed to eschatology. In a manner of speaking, eschatology. If, as the Christian claim goes the creator and the world that he subsequently creates are um, are different in an absolute sense if there is a um if there is an absolute binary that subsists between God and the world from eternity past, then no incarnation could possibly um, close that gap or close that, um, yeah, close that gap. And our, our assessment of the problems inherent within the doctrine itself in terms of showing why it would never work anyway, even if we were to posit that, um, I think goes to show it lends support, direct support to what I'm saying now that um, positing such a thing at all um, undermines the doctrine of creation ex nihilo uh, so it's a pretty simple pretty simple argument um, doesn't take very long to unpack, but I think it's quite effective. Um, although the subject is different, right? We're talking about creation ex nihilo and its influence upon the doctrine of the incarnation versus um, the questions, uh, you know, the question of eternal conscious punishment versus universalism. Uh, the very structure and nature of the two arguments are following the same pattern. Um, and so if, if David Bentley Hart's argument is, is valid, then my argument here 
that I just made uh, is also valid. So, in other words, the incarnation is superfluous and impossible anyway, if universalism is true.